morning, everyone. Welcome to the Virtual Harmful Algal Bloom Research Symposium. The Algal Bloom Action Team is thrilled to be hosting this event for a fourth year, and we're glad you can join us. This year's symposium is organized into two sessions. The morning session will have three presentations and will focus on HABs monitoring and treatment. We are also excited to have a special session featuring the team at the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program. The NOAA team will be sharing their work on assessing freshwater acidification and looking to gather feedback from you on your concerns, priorities, and interests regarding the effects of freshwater acidification to HABs. Then this afternoon's session will focus on HAB outreach and communication. My name is Erica Kleitz and I'm from Michigan Sea Grant Extension and I'll be your moderator for the morning session. Each session will be facilitated by a member of the Algal Bloom Action Team, a collaboration of water professionals, researchers, and educators from 12 states in the North Central region of the United States. Team members include the National Network of Water Resources Research Institutes, the North Central Region Water Network, and University Extension within each state in the North Central region. In addition to hosting this annual symposium, our team is developing a website of resources that can be used freely for outreach and education around harmful algal blooms in the North Central region. I encourage each of you to visit our website, northcentralwater.org slash HABS, which we are putting in the chat now. There you can explore some of the resources we have to date, including a what you should know fact sheet, a fact sheet on preventing and treating HABS for landowners, and a HABS frequently asked questions database. We're also excited to announce that today we are releasing a fact sheet focusing on HABS and their health related effects on animals. This fact sheet includes information on the signs of toxicity in animals, tips for domestic animals and livestock, and an overview of HAB toxins and their symptoms. It also includes contact information for HAB poisoning for each of the 12 North Central Region states. You can find that fact sheet and others on our website. In addition to this symposium, we also host a bi-monthly webinar series where we feature the latest HAB research all year round. On our website, you can find recordings of all past webinars, information on upcoming webinars, as well as access to information and recordings on our past HABS research symposiums. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. We will have three 20-minute presentations followed by a 10-minute Q&A session, followed by a 30-minute session with the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program. We'll also have a 15 minute break after our second presentation at 1015 Central Time. We will allow time for Q&A after each presentation. To have your questions addressed, please post them using the Q&A panel, which can be located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If there's a question already posted in the Q&A panel and you have the same question, you can use the Zoom upvote function on the question to ensure that we get answers to the most popular questions during the panel. Please note the Q&A panel function is separate from the chat function in Zoom. Again, questions for presenters should be posted to the Q&A panel. If you're having any technical difficulties during the symposium, let us know via Zoom's chat function and we'll be happy to assist you. You can also use the chat function to introduce yourself or discuss the research findings with fellow water professionals at today's symposium. Following this morning's session, we'll break for lunch and resume at 12.30 for session two. All symposium presentations will be recorded and will be posted to the Algal Bloom Action Team website at the conclusion of today's event. We'll also post the presentation slides to this website for your reference. All right, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome Heather Raymond. Heather is the Water Quality Initiative Director for the Ohio State University's College of Food and Agricultural and Environmental Sciences. In this role, she helps coordinate applied interdisciplinary water quality research that addresses the needs of local, state, and federal partners and helps to integrate research findings into extension outreach. Prior to accepting her position at OSU, Heather served as the State of Ohio Harmful Algal Bloom Coordinator where she led development of the nation's first HAB monitoring and reporting rules, assisted public water systems and lake managers responding to HABs, conducted applied research on HAB treatment in coordination with US EPA, 
and university partners, and taught webinars and workshops on HAB response. She serves on the Global HAB Scientific Steering Committee, National HAB Committee, Great Lakes HAB's Collaborative Steering Committee, and is a contributing author to state, federal, and international HAB guidance. All right, Heather, I'm gonna stop sharing and let you start sharing. Thanks, Erica. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Just take a second to share my screen. Can you see everything correctly? Yes, it looks great. Okay, thanks, Erica. Um, today I'll be talking about an innovative new ozone nanobubble treatment for HAP control. I know this is not what you signed up to hear, so I appreciate anyone that decides to stick around for this last minute addition to the agenda. Uh, the preliminary results I will be presenting are thanks to the work of an amazing interdisciplinary team of researchers, postdocs, masters and PhD students, and extension affiliated faculty at both Ohio State University and the University of Florida. We partnered with Ohio EPA, Department of Natural Resources, USEPA Office of Research and Development, NOAA NCOS, Wright State University, Grand Lake St. Mary's Restoration Commission, and the Sylvan Lake Association on this project. We're also working with an open and responsive Ohio industry partner, Green Water Solutions. We are incredibly grateful to the funding support we received from US ACE for this project. And um, I, I will say there's a lot of people that may have also assisted that aren't even directly uh, uh, affiliated or, or mentioned here because uh, we really love partnerships and we try to, to reach out and involve as many as we can. And on these, these wicked system problems like HABs, I think it's really important that you have a, a broad interdisciplinary team. As a quick introduction, uh, ozone is an oxidative treatment that has been used for decades in drinking water treatment applications. It has more recently been proven effective at breaking down multiple classes of cyanotoxins and was recently added as an additional cyanotoxin treatment barrier by the city of Toledo following their microsystems drinking water advisory. In natural water applications, however, without pretreatment, ozone effectiveness can be challenged by higher pH and natural organic matter concentrations making its use in uh, a lake treatment a little more limited. Uh, nanobubbles, however, um, help bridge this gap. They have a large surface area and their low buoyant forces keep bubbles from rising within the water column, allowing ozone within nanobubbles to more slowly diffuse and increase the contact time and distribution of the oxidant, in this case, ozone, within a water body. Incorporating ozone within nanobubbles to take advantage of nanobubble properties is a relatively new technology and data of efficacy of HAB treatment is limited. So our train attempted to address these research gaps through lab, mesocosm, and full-scale nanobubble ozone treatment field trials. And these studies were conducted concurrently with NBOT treatment optimization over the last two and a half years as our industry partner continued to um, evaluate the data and uh, optimize their systems as well. We used a nanosite to confirm the high densities of nanobubbles were being created by the lab scale MBOT unit provided to us by our industry partner. Uh, the nanobubble densities that we measured were at the very high end of values documented uh, previously in literature. Um, so we're very happy about that. Um, but while that was a promising result, we also did notice some visible bubbles. The nanobubbles are not visible to the naked eye. Um, when we saw this, we realized that there were some bubbles being produced in the microbubble range as well. Um, we are working with our industry partner on optimizing bubble production in the nanobubble size range and doing more work on this to, to help optimize the system. And again, um, encourage the uh, integration of ozone within the nanobubbles to take advantage of their unique properties. Um, next, we confirmed aqueous ozone and hydroxyl radical production using the indigo and TPT methods. Um, we are drafting a manuscript that explains how and why we adapted these methods for use in ozone nanobubble treatment evaluation. It's a little complex, so we encourage anyone that's interested in this research to, to look for that upcoming publication. One of our initial lab findings was that hydroxyl radical production by nanobubble collapse alone was negligible and only occurred at low pH range, and that's shown in the left panel. Um, and this is important because during natural bloom conditions, usually pHs are, are higher. Um, this was very important because some companies are marketing oxygen-only nanobubble HAB control technologies. 
But based on this data, the hydroxyl radical mode of HAP inactivation is unlikely. And so those um, the, the efficacy of those treatments might be reduced. Um, hydroxyl radical production via ozone nanobubbles was greater. Um, and we're working on additional bent scale experiments on, on this front. We completed two mesocosm trials at OSU's new mesocosm facility at Stone Lab on Lake Erie. I encourage everyone to come up and visit. It's really cool. Uh, the facility has 15 2200 liter mesocosm tanks that can be direct filled with water from Lake Erie or with hauled water from inland Lake Blooms. Uh, in this first trial, we filled tanks directly with Lake Erie water, but then added blue material that was from phytoplankton net con that we phytoplankton net concentrated in the open waters to simulate a harmful algal bloom because we weren't really seeing a high density bloom around the island at that time. Uh, primary goal of that trial was to compare NBOT treatment efficacy and impact to non-target organisms to traditional algaecide treatments that were already approved for use. Um, three tanks were sat as controls without treatment. Three tanks were treated with the maximum permissible labeled dose of a copper-based algaecide, and three tanks were treated with the maximum permissible labeled dose of a peroxide-based algaecide. Uh, these algaecides were selected based on which registered algaecide was the most effective for cyanobacteria control in this place, the microcystis, based on prior and concurrent um, algaecide investigations by this team that I won't go into at this time, don't have time. Uh, three additional tanks were then treated with a low ozone nanobubble treatment dose, and three final tanks were treated with a higher ozone nanobubble treatment dose. Um, the low dose we later calculated at 0.89 milligrams per liter, plus uh, some minor variance between tanks, and high dose was 4.6 milligrams per liter. Uh, the graphs here depict the total aqueous ozone measured from the samples, again, using the indigo method, uh, collected at the time of treatment in light green and one minute later in dark green. Uh, indigo was immediately added to the samples and then measured periodically for 10 days. Uh, the increasing aqueous ozone concentrations on the graphs demonstrates the release of ozone via nanobubbles over the, the 10 day time period. That's, I know people don't think in terms of hours, so 15,000 hours is roughly 10 days. Uh, the increasing, um, this project was the first that we were aware of to quantify the continuous release of ozone from nanobubbles over time. Uh, these images depict the control tanks on the left, copper treated tanks in the middle, and peroxide tanks on the right, 48 hours after treatment. Uh, a secchi disc was placed at the bottom of the tank uh, prior to collecting the pictures to help visually evaluate variability in water clarity between tanks. Um, a slight improvement in water clarity was observed in the peroxide treatment tanks, and there was one control tank that um, was slightly less dense than the other two control tanks in terms of biomass. In these images, the control tanks remain on the left, but the middle tanks are the low NBOT dose, and the tanks on the right are the higher NBOT dose, again, uh, 48 hours after treatment. Um, as you can readily see, the water clarity improved in all the NBOT treatment tanks. Since there was a concern about NBOT, NBOT or and I, sorry, I used nanobubble ozone treatment, NBOT is the little acronym we use, so if I say NBOT, that's what I'm referring to. Um, since there was a concern that this treatment um, could impact non-target organisms, um, and that was expressed by our agency partners. We compared the relative impact on the approved registered algae size at the label permissible dose to the NBOT treatment to the zooplankton community at 120 hours after treatment. We thought it was important to show the relative impact to something that was already approved. Um, this graph depicts the average of the three replicate tanks since variance between tanks was limited. Uh, as you can see, there's a significant negative impact to the zooplankton community in both the copper and the peroxide-based algaecide treatments. This is something that was actually a little surprising to us. Um, there was no impact, however, to the community at the low-dose ozone treatment, um, which some populations are actually increasing as compared to the control. And there's only a slight impact to the Bosmania species at the high-dose ozone treatment. Uh, but this was, again, still much less than the negative impact of the algaecides. Uh, this data demonstrates that MPOT treatment may be a preferable alternative to traditional algaecides. These graphs depict a subset of data from the first mesocosm trial with results colored based on treatment type. In the upper left, you can see the dissolved oxygen increase immediately after both the high and low MBOT doses, which um, we did expect. Dissolved oxygen, carbon shown in the lower left, increased slightly compared to controls in the MBOT tanks, but increases dramatically in the peroxide tank. 
uh, dissolved oxygen, or I'm sorry, dissolved organic matter increased in the aldicide treatments was unchanged in the low dose and decreased in the high end bot dose. Um, and this is a potential indicator of oxidative treatment. And the final graph to the lower right is a SUVA analysis of organic matter with lower values indicating a transition from aromatic to aliphatic um, species, which is another potential indicator of oxidative treatment um, as these ring structures are, the, are, are broken apart. Both NBOT treatments showed this transition as did the peroxide treatment at an intermediate time step. In the second mesocosm trial, we hauled water from a more severe microsystem producing Pycothrix bloom, Grand Lake St. Mary's, and compared a low intermediate and high ozone nanobubble dose to a nanobubble only, no ozone treatment and a control. And again, this was also to see how just the, the nanobubbles would respond um, in, as opposed to the ozone. So what was the independent role of each of those um, variables? Uh, three replicates of each treatment were again evaluated, um, but only one represented image per treatment taken 72 hours after treatment is shown here, um, just for space. Uh, a control and nanobubble only tank are depicted on the left, and the three ozone nanobubble doses are shown on the right, with the low dose at the top and the high dose at the bottom. Uh, the ozone to TOC ratio ranged from 0.18 for the low dose and 0.53 for the high dose. Um, ozone to TOC ratio is a parameter used in drinking water treatment guidelines, and something our team is evaluating is a potential measure to help lake managers estimate the dosage needed for HAB control in natural systems. Uh, as you can see, the NBOT treatments resulted in obvious improvement in water clarity. This graph shows the relative response to treatment using phycocyanin as a proxy for cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria were eliminated in both the high and moderate ozone doses by 48 hours post-treatment with little variation between replicates. Cyanobacteria were also greatly reduced in the low dose treatment. The nanobubble only tank had a slight reduction compared to control, but there was a large variability between tanks. By 96 hours after treatment, there was a slight decline in cyanobacteria in the control tanks, so the experiment was ended. Um, some data that's not shown was that, uh, interestingly, we did see a rebound in chlorophyll in the NBOT treatment tanks, um, representing a potential shift to green algae dominance. Um, but we're still waiting for the cell count molecular data. It's being processed right now, um, so we cannot confirm this at the time. But just some spot measurements we took with microscopes showed um, transition to diatom donimus, which which is which was wonderful. What we what we had hoped for. Um, we we're also still running the final QAQC on our microsystems data for this trial. Um, but I can share that based on the preliminary evaluation, the microsystems more than doubled from approximately 15 micrograms per liter to over 40 micrograms per liter in our control tanks. You know, during this time, kind of showing the natural bloom um, increase. Um, but toxins decreased to less than five micrograms per liter in all of the NBOT treatment tanks. And they were less than three. I, I, we're still waiting for QZ, maybe even non-detect in, in the high-dose tanks. Uh, this demonstrates the potential for the toxin degradation in addition to cyanobacteria inactivation following NBOT treatment. Uh, in addition to the lab and mesocosm trials, we also did three separate full-scale field trials in two lakes with different cyanobacteria communities. And this was kind of an iterative process. We do lab, field, mesocosm, then another year optimizing the system of um, going back into the field. So, so it's kind of an iterative process. This wasn't, wasn't linear. Um, so I will say that Mother Nature really likes to complicate things uh, and results interpretation of these trials was complex. Um, but we did learn a lot and are continuing to prove upon how to design a successful field trial. Um, I don't have much time to go into details, but provide a quick overview so you can see the potential for the technology at scale. Um, we tested the first generation and NBOT technology here at Sylvan Lake. It's a 95 um, million gallon private recreational lake with a history of HABs. Um, the NBOT units were placed near the stars on shore um, near sites G and E, and we had sampling sites at A through G weekly. Now, like another thing Mother Nature threw at us was we were planning on initiating the treatment in August. We wanna make sure Bloom was present, but an earlier than typical bloom in June prompted the local uh, lake association to request that we initiate our treatment as soon as possible. Um, I'm sorry, in July. Uh, since we wanted to res be responsive to our stakeholder needs, we moved up the start of the trial by four weeks. Uh, we collected pre-treatment data in June, installed the NBOTS the first week of July, 
Um, since we didn't have much fence scale data at that time, we didn't have those those phyto uh, those zooplankton results yet. Uh, we started with a very conservative low dose to minimize any potential impacts to non-targets. Um, when we did not see significant water quality change, though, or any impacts after that initial dose, we did increase our dose in early August, continued at that dose through September, and they conducted three weeks of post-treatment sampling to complete the trial. And I'll, I'll review some of that data. Um, here are all the parameters we monitored her for. So a, a lot of, of information was collected. Um, I only have time to present a subset of results. Um, I should note that uh, water level and local precipitation data proved to be critical for this because record level rain events uh, kept water levels at the top of the lake spillway with water flowing over the spillway on five separate occasions. That's on the bottom or uh, kind of in the middle. Uh, and this was in co stark contrast to prior summers when lake levels would drop by several feet over the summer with no water exiting via the spillway. Uh, these rain events complicated the data interpretation since we had to treat a much more dynamic system than we had anticipated. Instead of treating a bathtub, we taught, taught a, uh, treated a, a big moving river. Um, just to give you some context of what this looks like on site, the upper image shows the north end by unit inlet hoses on the left and two outlet hoses to the right. Units have a relatively small footprint. Uh, one case uh, contains the oxygen concentrator, ozone generator, and controls. The other houses, the pumps, and ozone is added via venturi system. Water is then discharged from the unit using patented nozzles designed to, to create additional nanobubbles. Uh, the units have automatic shutoffs if ozone concentrations are elevated or pressure drops, something we, we required from our industry partner. Um, that alerts would automatically be sent to team members based on predefined triggers. Um, this, is a, um, this is just a concern to potential um, exposure to ozone, which can be um, harmful to humans, you know, if, if they were, you know, in an in, enclosed setting, although this is all outside, so less likely to be concerned, still um, important to protect human health. Um, let's see, uh, this was the first long-term field deployment for these units, and the first time they're hooked up into 220 amp service, instead of being used uh, with a generator, um, so that provided some operational challenges. And we learned a lot. Uh, we worked with Greenwater Solutions over the summer on upgrades to the units, and additional improvements were made prior to field tra trials in subsequent summers, um, including housing the units in more easily moved and protected trailers, so we didn't have to kind of find a, a place to put them. Uh, we spent a lot of time in this lake sampling. We're thankful for our local partners to provide access to a boat, so we didn't have to trailer a university boat to the site weekly. Um, just gives you some context of what this looks like. Our drone is up in the upper left. In terms of water quality, um, we observed an increase in cyanobacteria in June. Uh, we installed the NBOT units in July, and then we're hit by our first major rain event. You can see that in blue. Uh, concentrations increased uh, throughout the lake, but then seemed to stabilize for the remainder of that month. In early August, we decided to add a third NBOT unit and double the ozone concentration from 30 to 60 grams per hour at each of these units. Um, cyanobacteria concentrations then decreased and remained low at all sites for the remainder of August, even after a large two and a half inch rain event. Uh, there was, these results we thought were looking pretty good. We also noticed visible degradation of cyanobacteria colonies at the treatment site in July and a shift in diatom ab abundance at the treatment site in August. Um, however, cyanobacteria was still present at the farthest downstream dam site at this time. During the treatment year, microcystins never exceeded the recreational health advisory levels, um, which was promising. Uh, the Lake Association said this was the first summer in recent memory where scums did not cover the entire lake in August and recreational microcystin advisories were not necessary. Um, I attended a public meeting at Sylvan Lake following the treatment trial and property owners thought the trial was excess, at least from their perspective. Um, this is some drone imagery that we flew uh, for the trial. Um, it showed in the first panel the variable density of the bloom throughout the lake at the start of treatment, um, the decrease in biomass during the high-dose treatment in August, and the resurgence of the bloom after treatment stopped, and lake mixing may have led to phosphorus input from sediments in the fall. And that's a, that's a longer story, um, but at least we saw the improvement there. Uh, cyanobacteria communities also changed throughout the trial, especially after we uh, increased the dose. Um, but it's difficult to determine if the NBOT treatment was a contributing factor, or if this was just a natural progression. Again, since we didn't have much historic data for this site, at least not uh, microbial community data. Uh, so overall, without a control, it's difficult to predict how Southern Lake Bloom would have progressed without NBOT treatment. 
Uh, so to place the results in context, we plot the cyanobacteria concentrations over time at neighboring um, Grand Lake St. Mary's, which uh, for this summer had actually transitioned to an anaphanosomenon dominant bloom in June, the same as sylvan. So it was a similar uh, species, similar ecoregion. Um, and while the Grand Lake St. Mary's and sylvan blooms trended similarly in June, the St. Mary's bloom increased more dramatically in July after the start of the sylvan treatment. Um, but of probably most interest is when the ozone dose was increased at Sylvan, sound bacteria concentrations declined by more than half, while at the same time concentrations at Grand Lake St. Mary's increased by 50 micrograms per liter. Um, St. Mary's also experienced fish kills and issued no contact recreational advisories due to microcystin detections at this time that were greater than 50 micrograms per liter. We also collected samples in 2022 as a no treatment control. Um, sound bacteria concentrations were greater in July and August during the no treatment year, but then again, this could be due to other environmental factors. Our next trial was conducted at a semi-enclosed beach on Grand Lake St. Mary's, a lake that NOAA has assessed as having one of the most persistent and highest density haves in the country. Um, this bloom is, is nine years out of 10 uh, dominated by planktothrix, but occasionally does switch to phanosomina dominance. Um, treatment units were placed at both east and west side of the beach with sampling sites labeled throughout. Um, eastern units are shown in the top image, western units uh, uh, discharge sites are shown in the upper right. And I know I'm starting to run out of time, so I'm going to try and speed through some of the results. Uh, this graph shows the average beach microcystin concentrations at our treatment beach in blue and two neighboring beaches in red and orange. Uh, dash line depicts when a curtain was installed to try and close the the uh, uh, the, the beach area and, and minimize water transfer between the main lake and the beach. Um, less than two weeks following installation, the current microsystems remained low and below the recreational advisory at the treatment beach, except for on one occurrence. Um, later in the summer, microsystem concentrations began to rise in the two control beaches, but remained low at the treatment beach. We also calculated it take approximately 30 days to cycle through all the water at the, the beach through our treatment units, because they, they were relatively small units again. Um, so that, that may have... Uh, been one another reason for the, the delay in efficacy. Uh, similar to mesocosm trials, we also noted a transition from more aromatic to aliphatic dissolved organic matter. Um, the effects of changing the characteristics of the organic matter and the food web needs further investigation and may also uh, be linked to uh, one of the cyanobacteria treatment mechanisms. So overall, um, and by units produced high density of nanobubbles and some microbubbles, Hydroxyl radical formation by collapse of nanobubbles alone is minimal and only occurs at low pH. This is uh, critical for folks that are looking at nanobubble only uh, units that don't incorporate ozone. Uh, ozone concentrations in held lab and field samples increased over time, demonstrating the release of ozone from nanobubbles. Um, in our mesocosm trials, we saw that zooplankton and phytoplankton community was negatively impacted in algaecide tanks. And um, I didn't mention this, but extracellular microcystins were also released in our copper algaecide tanks. Um, but NBOT response was consistent with controls, um, not, not as much or no impact to the community. Uh, NBOT was effective at all cyanobacteria, for cyanobacteria control at all of our evaluated doses. Uh, at Sylvan, due to lack of control and the precipitation events, um, uh, evaluation of efficacy is complex, um, but recreational advisories were not necessary during the trial, so local stakeholders were pleased. And for the Grand Lake St. Mary's uh, trial, microsystems uh, at the treatment beach were lower than control locations at neighboring beaches, advisories were reduced, but the treatment zone was really limited. And in this case, I think understanding that ozone to TOC ratio is important because um, we were treating a much more dense um, bloom at that time at Grand Lake St. Mary's and some of the other blooms at Sylvan. Um, and so, so the dose needed to be effective might be much higher. And with that, I'll, I'll thank you again for sticking around for a presentation not included on the original agenda. And I'm happy to answer any questions if there's a little time. Great, thank you, Heather. Uh, we do have some questions here. Uh, so the most, the one that most people wanted to know about, uh, let me find it here, is whether this treatment was anticipated to be able to be applied at large scales or only to smaller water bodies or intake systems? Uh, great question. I think that's what we're still trying to figure out with this ozone to TOC ratio. Um, Sylvan Lake was um, was a pretty decent sized lake, uh, I would say, uh, from a recreational lake standpoint, um, very heavily used in the summer in multiple beaches. Um, and I think that this the units could be effective at, at that scale, especially 
um, now that we have optimized systems and we're adding a little more ozone per unit and um, you know we could potentially go back in with a slightly higher dose. Um, scale of Grand Lake St. Mary's when we're talking the largest in the lake in Ohio or one of them is, is going to be is going to be difficult. But again, um, you know, when we look at so so I think, you know, with enough money, you could have more units and you could treat that lake. But again, it's going to be um, an ex potentially cost prohibitive. Um, I will say for drinking water up ground reservoirs, we think this could be an excellent uh, treatment for, for that scale. Um, and, and, you know, we'll know more. Uh, I also think that, you know, even for the algicides, you, you'll see that they won't be um, effective when, when blooms are very dense. Most of the recommendations are to, to treat, out, treat with algicides kind of at the bloom initiation stage. So I think, you know, these, these similarly ozone nanobubble treatment um, could be effective at kind of the early stages of bloom formation and kind of for inhibiting a further development of the bloom. Hope that answered. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we will have all the presenters' emails at the end as well, too, if people have follow-up questions. Um, the next question is, how long after the treatments were conducted were the zooplankton populations evaluated? Oh, I think we just went to 120 hours, in part because our control at that time, you know, we we're starting to see a, a decrease in abundance or in chlorophyll in our control. So um, control tanks will crash over time naturally, so it's hard to determine whether or not um, any changes in, in, in zooplankton community um, were, were due to um, just the, 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 the container effect of, of the mesocosm. Um, however, we are doing mo mo additional molecular um, data analysis, kind of wait till the end of the project to run all of our molecular samples. So we'll have more community analysis on the treatment lakes to see if, if there's any impacts, impacts there, but that data is forthcoming. Okay, great. Um... We have questions from people about whether it's possible, I guess, are you looking for more sites to do this research in, um, in other lakes or what are, what are the next steps? Um, sure. You know, if, if we can, I will say that US ACE project funding has ended. Um, we did recently apply for a harmful algorithm research initiative grant through uh, uh, the state of Ohio to do some additional work. Um, I think there is, you know, depending on, on funding, um, we would be able to go out there. I know working with UF, there was um, some additional funding from the state of Florida. So we're going to do some research down there at some canals and some, some smaller lakes in Florida. Um, I think, yeah, please let, I guess the, the short answer is yes, please let us know. Um, we're still, you know, if, if funding is available, we'll definitely be out there. And, and I think there's still a lot of questions. Um, every time we do a field trial, we get kind of some more interesting results. And so I think um, that's the ultimate goal is to, to move into the field. And, and I think drinking water reservoirs too might be a, a great place to, to do some trials um, now that we have the data to show that um, we don't have those impacts to non-targets. And so we, we need some additional, I think, uh, lab and, and field scale data before this could be used in a drinking water setting. So I think we, we, we're, we're getting close to being able to do that now. Okay, great. Um... There's a question about uh, if a control group was used um, with the same ozone input or dose, but in regular bulk or microbubble forms to highlight the unique strength of ozone nanobubbles over other large bubbles. Ah, okay, so so that's interesting. Um, I I hadn't thought we could do a potentially a trial where you just uh, uh, inject ozone into the water without it. But the, the, the part of the problem is um, like they might do in a treatment application is is you don't want the the bubbles to immediately be lost to the air. And so um that and that's probably one of the the bigger problems with doing any types of late treat treatment with a, a traditional approach is you just have a very limited zone of where that ozone you'd have you know a giant lake and a pocket of really clean water right around. <laughs> Did the ozone instead of giving that uh, that properties of the bubbles were built to kind of naturally just were there any other questions uh yes we have quite a few um on here so let's see um mark had a question about if there's aquatic toxicity trials and data to support allow ozone treatment in public water so i think you may have someone address that you're kind of like on the way to that yeah so we we definitely had to get permits for doing our our our, our trials, and um, and and there you know, there were some questions raised by the state. And as as we get more data, they're kind of more uh, apt to, to use it. The there is 
there were some some parameters on ozone. If you're less than a certain residual, then there shouldn't, you know, there, there's some data on traditional ozone. If as long as you maintain a ozone residual of less than, I can't even remember what the value is off the top of my head now. Um, then there's less impact to non-targets. So we were trying to maintain that. But I think developing our own guidelines, because we knew that the ozone could potentially persist in the nanobubbles, things are a little different with the nanobubbles. Um, you know, we're getting the data to, to be able to prove that. But each state is going to have different regulations. So I know we had to jump through different hoops in Florida than we had to jump through in Ohio. Um, we're also actually trying to work with US EPA to get this de uh, designated as an algicidal device. Um, and, and showing, um, documenting that we have the, the non-target data to support use as a device. And in that case, that might help make um, the burden of proof less for working in other states and other other systems. But right now it's been just kind of a state by state have to, you know, demonstrate our case and, and, and prove that, you know, we'll be collecting the data and, and, and working in a, in a um, a fashion that isn't going to have those impacts or we're going to, if we'd see it, actually we did also in our permit say, if we saw fish kill or any negative impacts, the trial would immediately stop and we'd collect data. Um, so so there were there are certain parameters that we're definitely falling under when we're doing these trials. Okay, great. Um, there's a question about what type of monitoring is needed to prepare for this sort of treatment. For instance, would a buoy detecting chlorophyll A be helpful as a pretreatment step? Um, so do you have any, any thoughts on that? So we we did deploy uh, buoys in our in, in, in both of our trials. So we did have kind of that pre-treatment data. I just didn't have time to even show it um, data throughout the trial and data after. So so that is nice as a continual um, source of information. I know um, the YSI EXO twos are what we use, so we can have both a phycocyanin and a chlorophyll signature, and then um, some additional parameters like PHDO. Um, uh, for us, we use dissolved organic matter because we think that's interesting. Um, and and that data was was for sure useful. Okay. Um, we had some questions from people about whether uh, individual lake associations could implement this sort of treatment. Um, what does that uh, look like uh, to you? Yeah, so actually that was one of the reasons why Sylvan Lake was so excited is that they they wanted to buy a unit. They are like, let's buy a unit. And and our, our partner's like, no, you know, there's still some operation maintenance things and still some questions with the ozone. So we're, we're, we're at this point kind of renting the units and, and trying them out. But I think that's the ultimate goal is to to have these units be made available to lake associations. I know um, Grand Lake St. Mary's, um, the DNR State Park Beach said, can we buy units, you know, and just have them out there. So um, I think we're getting closer. Um, again, I didn't even show the picture of now the units are kind of in a closed trailer. They're kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, it's harder to tamper with them. So there's a lot of, of kind of commercialization pieces that still have to happen. Um, but I think there there's definitely a promise for the technology as we move forward. Okay, great. Uh, Barbara had a question about uh, saying NBOT gets rid of toxic algae species, but do they affect the natural healthy species that should be in an ecosystem? Are there any cons to this uh, new technology? Um, again, I think it's all all based on on dose and, and trying to understand that because, you know, if you put enough ozone in the system, it'll kill everything, right? Um, but what we saw was actually because we're also producing uh, oxygen that um, th through this through the system or adding oxygen to the system, that um, because of that, we are getting almost, you know, especially at the lower doses, that that beneficial impact to the zooplankton community and the green algae um, that seem to be, um, especially the diatom, seem to be more resistant to to the treatment. Uh, so at this point, you know, it, it's looking pretty promising that, especially compared to the traditional algicides, um, this would be uh, a potential even benefit to some of the the non-target uh, species. Um, but again, we're still, we're just starting to scratch the surface and we haven't done vertebrates yet um, because that just requires a whole nother level of, of um, review protocols and things like that. But that's something we want to investigate. Okay, great. Um, Rashi, oh, I should, oh, wait, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. I should, I should no, say fine. that. That ozone is actually used as a treatment in aquaculture. So we're, we're thinking that we you know, don't anticipate to have uh, those impacts to fish species, but we want to verify it. Okay, go on. Sorry. All good. Um, we had a question about whether NBOT was effective with saxitoxin and other types of cyanotoxins. So um, the, good question. Um, we, we did in Sylvan have saxitoxin producing, have a saxitoxin producing bloom as well, co-occurring with the zombon. I didn't show that data. It is going to be um, effective at, you know, it seems like killing multiple different genera of cyanobacteria, but ozone is not known to be um, 
uh, is as good of an oxidant at uh, breaking apart sax toxins. The molecular structure is different. So whereas you can break up microcystins, I will say that is probably one limitation that ozone may not be as effective on sax toxin degradation. All right. Let's see. I think we've got time for another couple here. Let's see. Um... Is there any re is there any risk uh, that resources dedicated to treatment would be diverted from prevention? Oh, um, I think whenever I talk about this, we're like, hey, prevention is um, the long term goal and is something that we shouldn't lose sight of. But um, when you're talking about drinking water, drinking water emergencies, um, recreational impacts in the short term, you know, we, we've seen lakes recover, but you know, it could take you know 15, 20 years for us to reduce nutrients to a level. Um, and, and reduce internal nutrient cycling to a point where we're not having half. So I think these short-term uh, solutions are, are still still needed. And it will probably also be needed in, in areas where maybe nutrient reduction may not be possible, um, especially in, in maybe uh, third world countries or other places that have impacted waters that may not have the same uh, ability to, to focus resources on nutrient control. So yeah, both, dual, both, do both for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there were several questions related to cost. I don't know. I know you said this isn't really available commercially at this point, but any thoughts on what the cost of this type of unit might be? Yeah. So um, oh, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the economic data in front of me. That's one thing we're going to be working on. I know um, we for, for Grand Lake St. Mary's, they they had run a, um, uh, an aeration system prior to running the it, the 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 nano bubble system at that beach to which was not effective the aeration system was not effective but in terms of power cost it was it was was about the same in terms of power cost to the aeration system um, but of course you have also the 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 capital costs up front but um we were we were doing some back of the envelope calculations in in terms of like how much a, an algicidal water system might apply per year and it, it it might be in the in the ballpark so we're thinking it might not be too cost prohibitive in, in certain settings. All right, great. Well, we're gonna move on to the next presentation, but if you have a chance, uh, you can also take a look at the other questions uh, in the Q&A box uh, after this. So thanks so much. No problem, thank you. All right, gonna get our next slide up here. All right, our next speaker will be Spencer Williams. Spencer is a PhD student at Kent State University. His major is Earth Sciences with a concentration in environmental remote sensing and his research focuses on developing advanced water quality tracking procedures to monitor the spread of harmful algal blooms and acid mine drainage contaminants over time. Spencer, go ahead and take it away. Hello, can um, everyone see my presentation screen? Yep, you're not in presentation mode quite yet. Okay. At least from what I'm seeing. Are we, are we in presentation mode? Okay, yep. good. looks great. All right. Well, um, hello, my name is Spencer and I'm a student from Kent State University and I'm excited to be a part of such a distinguished panel just to share with you some of the things that I've been learning um, and working on in the initial stages of writing my doctoral dissertation. The title of my presentation is Employing Remote Sensing Techniques to Understand Seasonal Changes in Water Quality in the Muskingum Conservancy Watershed District. My project is focused on addressing the negative impacts that anthropogenic activities in industry, agriculture, and mining 
um, have had on aquatic environments. Increased use of synthetic fertilizer livestock waste, pesticides along with global climate change has caused nutrient oversaturation and heightened phosphorus load in local reservoirs leading to an influx of seasonal algae growth. Now, my research area is in the Muskingum Conservancy Watershed District, which is a mouthful. So going forward, I'll just refer to it as the Muskingum. The Muskingum houses several uh, reservoirs surrounded by land use applications that could cause significant degradation to water quality over time. In this research project, we've employed novel remote sensing approaches to water quality analysis to investigate the effects that such contaminants have had and introduce a low cost, non-intrusive and time-saving procedure for monitoring the proliferation of algal blooms and recognizing changes in water quality over time. So the Muskingum was established in 1933 to provide flood reduction and water conservation in the state's largest wholly contained watershed area. By 1939, 16 dams and 10 reservoirs had been constructed since their construction, the dams have reportedly spared the region um, over a billion dollars in property damage from flooding. The watershed expands about 8,000 square miles, taking up about one fifth of the entire state of Ohio. And it's inhabited by um, more than 2 million residents. Satellite imagery and other remote sensing techniques provide cost-effective methods for surveying both large and small aquatic ecosystems. Continuous mon monitoring methods are available for water quality assessment, which are helpful in surveying vast aquatic and terrestrial landscapes. This is particularly beneficial um, as traditional field-based extensive, um, ex uh, traditional field-based um, collection practices are um, often costly and they have longer delays. So um, to go over a few of um, my objectives for this research project, um, we wish to uh, assess land use, land cover surrounding the Muskingum reservoirs to quantify the impact on water quality, um, identify effects of land use, land cover on nitrogen and phosphorus, sediment load and algae composition, we will use satellite imagery and other sensing methods to monitor Muskingum reservoirs using multispectral and hyperspectral instrumentation. And we will differentiate suspended solids from cyanobacterial pigments and pigment degradation products. And uh, lastly, we'll employ land use and land cover maps with field, with field sampled water quality validation measurements. Um, I'll begin this talk with um, some methodology, and uh, then we'll transition into a breakdown of how we conducted our analysis, followed by an introduction of our preliminary results, and then we'll briefly discuss those results and compare and contrast the two preliminary or the two primary spectral methods we've used so far in the study. And to wrap it up, I'll give some final thoughts and take questions. So um, we collected water samples in the field, which gave us temperature, turbidity, pH, salinity, and indicators for harmful algae in terms of total biovolume. Our hyperspectral field instrument recorded numerous measurements for water surface reflectance at 10 nanometer resolution in the visible near infrared wavelength range of about 400 to 900 nanometers with a 10 degree field optic um, for optic lens. Images from our Muskingum study site were analyzed using um, Sentinel-2 AB uh, multispectral imaging, um, their satellite, and uh, KSU and the KSU Veramax rotated principal component analysis was applied to unmix the spectral signals that we retrieved from both from both the satellite imagery and hyperspectral field measurements. We then generated z-scores by subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation. And we used a multilinear regression to identify constituents and determine variance in our statistical analysis. Sentinel-2 um, 
is a wide swath, high resolution, multi-spectral imaging mission used to monitor vegetation, soil, and water cover. The satellite carries an optical, an optical instrument payload that samples 13 spectral bands. The bands range from visible and near infrared, about 400 to 900 nanometers, um, to shortwave infrared wavelengths along a 290 kilometer orbital swath. Sentinel-2 provides a revisit time of five days at the equator in cloud-free conditions. Use of the data set in Google Earth Engine allows us to process multiple images consistently and quickly in the cloud using custom Python API scripts. Okay, so now let's get into um, what I like to discuss, which um, involves dissecting how we use the KSU Veramax rotated principle component analysis and how it works. So first we have a correlation matrix and the X and Y axis are bands in terms of derivative. Let's see if I can get this laser pointer to work. Um, and they show a strong positive value um, with the red cubes and a strong negative value with the blue cubes. So when we look at this, we can see that most of the cubes in the matrix are either bright red or bright blue, which means that we're receiving a good correlation between each of these bands consisting of bands one through eight A. The cubes are shaded gray in the center um, and they represent uncorrelated values um, that we refer to as random noise. The I next door, we have the eigenvalues labeled with fractional variance um, graph. So component one explains the most variance with about 30%. Component six explains the least amount of variance at 3.5%. Here, variance means the amount of information retrieved from each component. Variance is just the amount of detectable signal or in essence information that we can use to identify what's in the water column or random noise that's too convoluted to be identified. When we add up fractional variance along the top here, it comes to about 75% of detectable um, variance. We simplify our model so that total variance is always 100%. So when we subtract total variance from fractional variance, We've already established um, from the fractional variance that we've already established is 75%. We are left with 25% um, of the signal that's considered bad signal, which we've um, uh, removed from the model. So as a result, we can determine that there are six components um, here that have enough systematic signal to be identified um, with our methods. The commonality graph is telling us that the leading three components represented by the blue uh, curve, components one through three, explain more information than the trailing three components four through six. And that's not surprising considering the smaller values um, that we're getting for components four through six um, in the fractional variance chart. So in essence, the larger the fractional variance, the more good signal we retrieved from the component. To reiterate, we use the Veramax rotated principal component analysis to decorrelate the good signal so it can be identified. When we do this, the filters that are left behind are an assortment of spectral shapes that we can then match to a spectral library that we've sourced largely from the USGS database to identify the kind of algae, sediments, or other pollutants um, that are present in the Muskingum reservoirs. Here we plot the component data against wavelength. We examine the spectral shape of the red edge response roughly between 670 and 720 um, nanometers because um, that places it in the uh, visible and near infrared um, bands. The red edge interval is important because it's indicative of the part of the electromagnetic spectrum where spectral reflectance of green vegetation, such as algae, changes rapidly. Component one correlates with cyanobacteria pigment, with the cyanobacterial pigment phycocyanin. Um, it has a good spatial pattern and it explains the most variability for us to interpret the spectral response. Component two 
correlates with nostoxanthin carotenoid, which is an accessory pigment of cyanobacteria. And component three is identified as chlorophyllide, a harmless precursor to chlorophyll. Used in photosynthesis, um, it's also a degradation product of chlorophyll. Component four relates to fucoxanthin, which is an accessory pigment found in diatoms, um, also known as red tide. And component five relates to carotenoids found in cyanobacteria. Um, and we think that component six relates to iron oxide to an iron oxide mineral feature. But it's important to note that component six has the smallest amount of variance, placing it closer to the noisy part of the signal. And the odds that we can interpret component six are generally lower than the odds that we can explain for the previous five components that components that we saw in the commonality uh, plot. So here we want to show animated GIF images that I generated using Python API scripts. It is showing a succession of 22 satellite images over a span of two years under 20% cloud coverage from one of our reservoirs um, at Wood Lake. The red color indicates where the algae is most dense and the blue shows where algae is less dense um, and the yellow, of course, is a middle ground. Gaps in the images are likely due to sensor error, error in the satellite that we experience due to cloud coverage. The pie chart here is calculated from cell count data retrieved from water samples that we physically collected in the field. They represent total biovolume of each algae phylum showing its distribution in the lake at a particular sampling station in terms of their percentages. Um, here we're showing more of the animated GIFs, um, emphasizing that density for components four through six, um, as well as a pie chart from a different sampling station showing a even distribution of algae that is quite similar to the, um, the chart that we saw in the previous slide for this sampling location. This diagram, uh, kind of just gives us a schematic, an idea of how we collect our data when we're out in the field, um, the hyperspectral data. So the field spectral data is collected using a handheld um, spectral device. Um, it has hyperspectral capabilities um, and it measures in the visible and near infrared wavelengths of 400 to 900 nanometers. The sensor was calibrated using a boom was calibrated, I'm sorry, and it was attached to a boom, which is this kind of long black stick here, um, and held off the side of a sampling collection uh, boat um, to collect reflectance and irradiance data. During our procedure, we ran at least three sets of eight measurements, yielding 24 reflectance readings at each sampling location. These readings are averaged together, and the derivative is calculated. We use the same procedure to capture solar irradiance and shaded irradiance. The reflectance data is collected at hyperspectral resolution um, or one nanometer. The samples over um, are then interpolated to 10 nanometers and averaged over the bandwidths of Sentinel-2 bands, one through AA, before running the VPCA to best mimic how we process the satellite data that we just discussed um, in the previous slides. So the two data sets can be integrated properly. Um, water reflectance measurements taken from uh, this hyperspectral handheld device provide information that helps us correct for sensor error and determine the validity of the satellite measurements. Here we have um, a series of plots that uh, show the amount of variance explained or the good, quote unquote, good signal that we can use to identify each component from our field data. The blue curve is what we retrieved in the field and the orange curve um, is, from established, is from an established library of known spectral IDs. So component one loadings are correlated with elite. Um, component two loadings are correlated with glauconite 
um, with a 33.4% variance. Um, component three is correlated, correlated with um, paroxine. And component four is correlated with chlorophyll A carotenoids. Our component five is correlated with um, chlorophycea, chlorophycea. And um, our component six is correlated with um, iron oxide mineral hem hematite. Initially, we had a couple of inconsistencies with the results from our two approaches. So um, we compare those um, approaches here. So some of our component results from the satellite imagery did not exactly match the ones that were collected in the field with our handheld uh, ASD instrument. Component one was one of them, which leads me to a few things that we're going to want to consider when conducting this kind of multi-scaled analysis. Our multispectral satellite data was collected from 22 images over a span of two years. The hyperspectral field data was collected on one day at eight separate sampling stations. Because of the temporal resolution, of the Sentinel-2 satellite, there is a five-day gap in, in imagery collection. We know that the biggest source of error um, in satellite imagery are um, clouds. And during our field work, there was an overcast and we had to pause multiple times due to heavy intermittent rain. In our ASD field results, we are seeing indicators for illite, and um, kaolinite. Um, so it is our theory that the reason for the influx of sediment that we are seeing in our component one field data is primarily due to precipitation that caused mud and clay to saturate the water column. As a result, we must take into account that these two approaches, one collected by satellite and the other collected proximally in the field, could be measuring varying conditions based on their respective limitations. Um, and lastly, to wrap things up with a preliminary summary, spectral data indicates that Tappan and Atwood reservoirs are dominated by photosynthetic phytoplankton communities and um, also suspended sediment. Cell count data reveals that Tappan Lake is dominated with cyanobacteria, and Atwood Lake has uh, a more of a, a more even distribution of algae present, with diatoms taking a slight precedence. Precedence. Cyanobacterial pigments and pigment degradation products found in the lakes during our fall sampling period could be the result of prior summer bloom activity because cyanobacteria are often found in warmer waters. Many primary pigments have a characteristic red edge response that we need to be mindful of, of intensive reflectance at um, certain peak intervals between um, 670 and 720 nanometers. Weathering events and spatial and temporal differences in sensors may cause inconsistencies between data retrieved from satellite imagery and ASD measurements collected in the field. And um, the presence of iron oxide minerals are likely linked to the extensive coal mining operations that are um, done in the Muskingum region. I will delve further into this in my next manuscript, where I'll extend the use of these approaches to try and analyze AMD-derived chemical compounds, sulfates, and um, et cetera. <clears throat> Lastly, I would like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude to my sponsors. Their generous funding and valuable guidance have been instrumental in initiating uh, this research project. And with that, thank you so much for your time and I'll take any questions. Thanks a lot, Spencer. We do have some questions coming in here. People can continue putting their questions in the Q&A pod. Uh, 
So the first question that I saw was about the pie chart that you showed um, yeah. about the samples taken. And the question was just, were, was that pie chart showing just the data that you recorded in the field or was that also uh, based on the satellite data? That pie chart was actually showing um, only the data collected in, in, the, fi in the field, right? From okay. the, the cell count data, yes. Okay, great. And the two different methods you were using was the satellite data and then the handheld um, data that you were recording um, in the field. Correct, with the hyperspectral um, okay. handheld device, yes. Awesome. All right, uh, the next question um, is from Caroline and it's how comparable are the spectra from a library with conditions in the water body? And how do you figure out how comparable they may be? Um, well, the Veramax rotated principle um, component analysis, pretty much um, that particular um, process uh, helps us determine how comparable uh, they are. Um, I could go back to like one of these graphs um, and uh, we can basically kind of see um, instances where the spectra kind of line up. And um, basically these variance percentages um, give us a good indication of um, the amount of information that we can use to compare to those um, IDs from the spectral library. So that's kind of how we, how we do that. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, Lloyd says, thank you for your excellent presentation. Given the gap in temporal resolution from the MS-1 um, on Sentinel-2AB, have you considered data from the OLI on Landsat 9 and Landsat uh, 9, albeit with somewhat different spectral coverage and a lower spatial resolution, or yeah. also from commercial providers, potentially? Yes, yes. Um, We have considered using Landsat, but um, with the coarse resolution um, um, and, and these methods, I don't believe that that would be the best option for us, but it is something that we may consider in, in some of our future, future work. All right, great. Um, the next question is from Ruchi, and uh, the question is whether the reservoir morphometry plays a role in how efficiently you can identify algal groups versus the sentinel imagery. So for example, does small, shallow, complicated morphology um, have any effect on that data? I'm sorry, could you repeat the beginning of it? I think sure. I'll... Yeah, I think but it's I'll... basic. I think okay. it's about the shape that the um, of the physical water body and whether that's impacting um, the imagery. So like the does a very, yeah. Go ahead. Okay, um, so the shape of the water body, like the shape of the the lake, um, that we're that we're studying, and does that impact the what? Does it impact um the imagery or how effective the imagery can record um the the data that you're talking about? So, for example, are there like some types of water bodies that would be difficult to do via satellite, but better via handheld or something oh, like that? Oh, I see. I, I see. think is the question. Okay. Okay. So. With the satellite, um, it has such a wide swath that the shape and the size um, of these particular lakes would, would not be an issue. Um, now, with using the handheld device, um, you may just want to um, take data from more sampling locations. Like you'll want to kind of get an even distribution across the entire lake. So there might be some differences there with the amount of um, sampling locations that you choose and maybe where those sampling locations are, are going to be positioned um, for you to collect. But as far as the satellite data, that, that wouldn't be an issue at all in this case. Um, there was also a question about whether you have any water samples or optical and microscopic analysis to validate your results. That's what I was showing in the pie chart. Those were water samples that we collected um, and we sent off to the lab to be um, analyzed um, via cell count. I think it was bio volume um, uh, that we retrieved. And so that's what those, those pie charts that I show next to the animated GIFs were showing us. Okay, great, thank you. 
All right. I believe that is all for the moment. Double checking to see if we've got anything else here. Um, oh, we do have one more question. Um, when do you anticipate uh, the completion of your dissertation or publications of papers based on today's the content of today's presentation? Um, well, um, I'm kind of in a situation where I should be graduating in the fall of 2025. So I imagine that we could initiate um, some of these publications um, in about a span of a year or so, um, somewhere in there. Um, we're hoping to uh, to get some of this work out there. Okay, great. Um, and one more question um, from Chelsea. Uh, you covered the components uh, one through six that you saw had an impact. Were there components that you looked at which did not show an impact? And were you surprised by what showed an impact and what didn't? Um, yes, so with the method that we used, um, we don't extend um, into any other components that we retrieved because we basically say that those components that are past component six, um, they contain too much of that random noise or convoluted signal for us to be um, um, certain of, of what can be identified um, at that point. So uh, the good part about using the um, Vera Max Rotated Principle Component Analysis is that from the beginning of that of that processing, it removes um, a fair amount of that kind of random noise that we can that we can identify like out of the system. So we don't even so it kind of gives us a more accurate data set in that way. Um, if that kind of answers the question. All right, great. Well, thanks so much. Uh, I think that's all we've got for now. Um, uh, you can take a look at the questions um, as well, but I think we got to all of them. All right. And thanks. yeah, thanks again. All right. All right, so we do now have our break. So our next presentation will start in 15 minutes. Um, that is at 10.30 uh, Central Time. So we will see everyone then. All right, welcome back. We're gonna move on to our next presentation. All right, our next speaker is Arif Rahman, who is a research scientist specializing in soil, water, and bioenergy resources at the Ohio State University South Centers in Piketon, Ohio. With expertise in analytical and environmental chemistry, he has made significant contributions to the field. Rahman has authored numerous research papers focusing on soil, water, and air environments. Currently, Raman is involved in several projects, including the development of a sunlight irradiated photocatalyst technique for removing cyanotoxins released by algae and water. He is also working on development of agricultural adsorbents to remove phosphate and nitrate from agricultural fields, as well as exploring innovative fertilization techniques to enhance antioxidant chemicals in fruits. Raman's accomplishments include over 84 peer reviewed journal publications two book chapters, and two patents. He earned his PhD in chemical engineering and has been engaged in teaching and research activities at various universities worldwide since 2001. Prior to joining the Ohio State University in 2019, Raman held positions as an associate professor of chemistry at the University of Dhaka, Bangladesh, until 2015, and as an adjunct assistant professor of chemistry at Clarkson University in Potsdam, New York. All right, go ahead and I'm gonna stop sharing and let you share your screen.
Can you hear me? Yep. And we can see your screen. Looks great. Hello, my name is uh, Arif Rahman. Uh, the title of the project, I'm working using solar photocatalytic composite to remove microcystin alar in water. Uh, myself, Arif, and our team leader, Rafiq Islam, and Richard senior assistant, uh, Jan Bo. Uh, the frequent uh, occurrence in intense algal bloom in surface water, especially Lake Kiri, is a serious problem in Ohio. Most common toxin produced by cyanobacterial algal bloom are microcystin. Uh, it is uh, MCLR, one of the toxic compounds, a possible carcinogen to human. Uh, what is the MCLR? Actually, MCLR is a cyclic heptapeptide containing seven amino acids. If you look at the right uh, photo, the EDA, which is the toxic part of the MCLR compound. So our target is to actually degrade and break down this toxic part. There are a couple of technology available to, to remove, degrade, uh, to work with MCLR, the dealing or management. Adsorption and filtration could isolate, but the toxicity remain due to its structural complexity. Titanium dioxide can be used to degrade MCLR due to its strong oxidizing capacity, stability, low cost, non-toxicity towards both human and environment. However, titanium dioxide photocatalytic oxidation cannot be used efficiently in large water system. If I want to use that uh, lake area, it's not possible unless it has a support source and contact with sunlight. How titanium dioxide works? It's just producing hydroxyl radical with the help of sunlight or solar irradiation. And the oxygenated hydroxyl or oxygenated radical reacts any kind of organic pollution in the water. Uh, it produces carbon dioxide and also mineralized products. The objective of our work was to develop a composite with titanium base using also adsorbent and evaluate its effectiveness and understand the, its capacity and capability under lab base, like simulated solar radiation or outside natural sunlight solar radiation. And also finally, we have a plan to implement this technique to a prototype um, development method uh, for the degradation of micro 16 LR and even well, using natural solar radiation. And we, we can finally apply to big watershed or lake area. Hi, Arif, sorry to interrupt. Your audio is a little poppy. Um, I'm wondering if maybe you can take your video off and we'll have a little better sound. Okay, can is uh, can uh, is that okay now? Yeah, let's try it. Hello. All right, let's uh, yeah, go ahead and we'll see if that uh, improves it. Yeah. Materials and method. So what we made, we made a composite based on titanium dioxide, uh, jack soil composite. If you look at the photo, left-hand side, actually, it has a zinc-activated charcoal, 14%, titanium dioxide, 21%, and soil and sodium silicate. Soil and sodium silicate use, soil is as a binder, and sodium silicate actually glue so to bind all the things. And then finally, we applied a furnace for heat up, like temperature, temperature, sintering temperature. We applied 500 degrees Celsius four hours. So what are the advantages of using composite? This composite has adsorption capacity because it has charcoal, it has a photocatalyst, and titanium dioxide will not mix because it's a solid ball, so it will not mix with water. A neat network of balls along with floater will give a broader application. So how we prepared activated carbon in our lab? 
we collected miscanthas from our agricultural land, sun dried, and it was grinded, and it's chemical treatment. After that, we got the black right hand side is the charcoal adsorbent. And then finally, how we made the composite, the round shaped ball. We mix all together, for example, soil 43%, titanium dioxide 21%, and activated charcoal 14%. But we made so many times of trial and error to make a good shape and hard ball. So microsecid LR in our lab, we have analyzed using ELISA test method. In the lab, how can we get a solar, like a sunlight? We cannot get sunlight inside lab. That's why we uh, use a artificial uh, solar lamp uh, in our lab, which can provide 350 nanometer of uh, wavelength light. If you look at that, we arrange this way. It was a whole only technology, so it gives the artificial sunlight. We prepare two kinds of balls initially, like one is without charcoal and without soil. If you look at the right side, the ball, two ball, we found that the red ball, hard and stable, but removable efficiency only 82, 82%, not 100%, because it doesn't have any charcoal. It has soil, titanium dioxide, and sodium silicate. Again, we try to make another ball, like without any soil, just charcoal, that means jet, titanium dioxide, and sodium silicate. But it's very unstable because without having a binder material, it's like very soft, it mixes with the water. If you look at the right, the left side graph, see, without charcoal, efficiency is a little bit low. That's why we again optimize. Finally, optimize this kind of ball where titanium dioxide, jack, soil, and sodium silicate. And it was not mixed with the water because it's very strong. Even if I uh, drop from my hand you know, to the floor, it was not break up. So it was not broken. So it's very, very stable and hard. Then we did some experiment. If you look at the right-hand side, only adsorbent itself remove uh, 30 30 percent whereas titanium dioxide and adsorbent and soil ball can remove 96 percent remove means it doesn't remove all the microcystin part because remove this is degrade if you look at the graph like pt means concentration at that time divided by c0 means concentration initially how much we took we took actually 10 microgram that per liter, 10 ppb. So this is the optimization, uh, optimization graph. Just it shows definitely adsorption has contribution. We also optimize the amount of adsorbent. If you look at the graph, see, we could reduce 96% of microsystem LR with the use of solar exposed. Uh, in the lab system, actually, laboratory system. This is not outside, it's entirely in the laboratory system. And also we optimize volume. A lower volume give higher reduce, some, uh, reduce reduction is uh, obvious. And also concentration we try to optimize. Like five PP, PVB, 10 PVB, 20 PVB. And the solar exposure time actually in the lab, we use two hours only, only two hours because it's strong in the lab because distance between the light and the uh, sample was too low. And now we optimize the pH. pH is actually important, uh, very, very important, since the uh, uh, microcystin LR actually in the water actually negatively charged. So we need something positive charge so that it could attract each other. At acidic pH, titanium dioxide surface became positive charge. So if you look at the graph, from pH 2 to 2 to 6 is almost actually P. surface of the titanium dioxide is positive. So that's therefore is a, it was a 99.5% reduce. But 
in our natural system, water pH is not acidic. So it's uh, slightly uh, neutral, but around seven. So we did our experiment actually keeping pH seven. And if we increase the pH like polluted water, so MCLR is negatively charged molecule and it, it will like it will hit titanium dioxide because of the negatively charged and the uh, uh, titanium dioxide as well actually is a negative charge. So both repulse each other. That's why red reduction will be low. Then finally we move to the our original sunlight experiment. So we did some experiment outside. If you look at that, we put it some uh, container with uh, our composite material. And uh, we also measured the average solar radiation is a 487 watt per meter square area. And sunlight exposure was six hours. Maybe question arises why inside two hours, outside six hours? Because sun distance is so far away and intensity is not like inside the lab. So to degrade everything, uh, we had to explore more, give more time. In that way, we optimize volume. We optimize concentration of the microcystin LR in the outside and the amount and also the uh, how many balls actually per so we use five gram, actually two ball or three ball. The question is outside solar system, like sunlight has actually many, many kind of wavelengths, but our requirement is to approximately 387 nanometer. So the this uh, percentage of that kind of wavelength is very limited. That's why it takes long time to degrade. That's why, uh, at least six hours required. And pH also similarly, we found like a low pH, like highly acidic pH, 99%, but like water pH is seven, so approximately 96%, 96.5% removed at pH seven. Finally, we use our composite in a real algae. We took our uh, algae solution and we got this kind of like colorless solution. It clearly shows that the composite has the efficiency to degrade chlorophyll. That means uh, like a green color actually it was a chlorophyll and after that it become colorless. But if I take higher volume at the right hand side, so the color is not so white, like colorless, like something is still remain. That means it needs uh, more time to degrade 100%. Because here we only use three hours of sunlight. The so toxicity of degraded product kill, at what stage of treatment does the water become detoxified? So initially I have mentioned the ADA is the main toxin, actually toxic part in the microcystin LR. So our target is to break this part anyway. Microcystin LR loses its toxicity as soon as the molecule is transferred to oxidized product. So how we will know whether actually it breaks or not? So that we that's why we need some analysis. The prototype prototype using natural solar system it is uh, in our uh, center. We grow some algae in a big tub. And our plan is to use that composite using a polymeric foam, floating material. Uh, actually, we are not uh, continuing this work right at this moment because sunlight intensity is very low during winter at Ohio. So we are waiting for the, the summer to carry out this experiment, but we made our prototype design and uh, experimental system. The question is actually, after degradation, what kind of product can be produced and whether they are toxic or not toxic? From the literature, actually already mentioned that many people work with uh, microcystin using titanium dioxide solar light and they 
analyze this kind of compound, like one to 17 and many more can be produced, but those are not toxin at all because it doesn't have ADA. So that is the one kind of uh, proof that the, our composite can work. It will not produce any secondary pollution in the water system. Titanium dioxide and zinc activated charcoal and soil composite actually really efficient, approximately 96%. The concentration was actually we use 10 ppb to eliminate massive LR compounds under lab and natural sunlight, both the system. After the reaction, the electron and the hole recombine because titanium dioxide actually produced electron, that electron produce hydroxyl, returns to its original state. So again, it's reusable. It doesn't, it is not absorbent like we will throw it. So again, it, it will be in the water system. So we can use again and again. This makes titanium dioxide a reusable catalyst. Both titanium dioxide and degraded product leaving no harmful residue or toxin making it environmentally compatible treatment option for the degradation and removal of harmful microcystin LR toxin in water. We expect to use the composite in a prototype under natural solar radiation and especially in the big, uh, big, big watershed. And also in our greenhouse, we made big uh, water tub where we are growing continuously uh, algae and we will artificially add microcystin in that system so that we can apply and we can find the efficiency of our composite so we are waiting for the sunlight maybe summer we will apply uh, this thing so thank you everyone if you have question Great, thank you, Arif. We do have a number of questions for you, so I'll just go ahead and start up at the top. So Ed had a question about uh, HAB occurrences creating high alkalinity water conditions uh, with a pH SU greater than seven. Will the composite balls be truly effective under such conditions? Well, great question. Yes, that's why all of our experiments we did at natural water system and natural water system not always actually seven, actually mostly it's very ideal situation, mostly seven point something, 7.4 and highly polluted water, um, even is close to eight. So we did, but the efficiency was around 90%. Since I have mentioned like titanium dioxide surface become negative, slightly negative at alkaline system. So the attraction between the microcytin LR and also titanium dioxide slightly reduced, but still it has some efficiency because around 90% efficiency to degrade. Okay, great, thank you. Um, a key component that you mentioned was soil. How many types of soil were tested? Is the type of soil likely to affect the performance or physical properties of the material? Uh, well, great question. Actually, soil doesn't have any role here unless it's binding because soil after like 500 degrees Celsius temperature, Soil doesn't have any quality of its soil characteristic because it's burn out everything, whatever it has, any kind of organism burn out. But titanium dioxide is uh, it cannot burn because it's melting and a boiling temperature is more than thousand degrees Celsius. Okay, so that's why soil doesn't have any role unless just bind and give a shape. Okay. Uh, could these uh, these titanium uh, dioxide balls be useful in large bodies of water? Do you have any thoughts yes. on like the scale? Yes, that's the, our actually uh, the plan. Uh, our project actually uh, that yes, uh, we want to uh, use in a big scale, like uh, using some floating material. Since titanium dioxide doesn't have any environmental uh, like uh, impact, like uh, pollution, secondary pollution. No, you can use reusable. So it, if it is uh, flow on the water system, maybe like after three months, if you collect everything again, again. 
put again new batch. So continuously you can use. So there will be no problem. Okay. And there was a question about how they would be deployed. Um, would they be in mesh bags or just directly in the water, the balls, or how how would that be done? Okay, so, uh, great question. Because photocatalyst definitely should touch the sunlight. You know, it can have reach. It should reach the sunlight. So we will put in a floating system, so up and on, like it will go down and up, go down and up, because the wave flow, water flow, so that it can re at least get some sunlight, so that it can produce the hydroxy. That's why we will use some floating ball, like fisher, fishermen use, like uh, to catch the fish in a big lake, so some floating ball, so we can use that kind of system in a big lake, as just like a lake Erie. Okay. Um, and then another question was about the longevity uh, of the balls in water. Um, I, I know you mentioned that they're re, um, the sunlight will refresh them, but do you have any sense of like, could that go on for years or how long that might be? Yeah, it depends on the degree of uh, contamination in the area, uh, like a lake water. Like a too much contaminant, that means too much exposure of the, like a covered the surface. So the longevity will be, lower if too much like pollutant. For example, if some um, water system is, actually it's usually understandable. If the pH is very high, uh, for example, um, dye containing, like some other, like a municipal wire is going also there, the pH is still more than eight. So the surface will be blocked of the titanium using of that kind of exposure. So longevity will be like a, only two months, three months because uh, the surface is always blocked. And titanium dioxide uh, doesn't have the capacity to degrade everything into carbon dioxide because it will also produce some byproduct. So some byproduct will also retain on the surface of the uh, ball. So definitely we have to move that things uh, after a couple of months if too much pollution. Okay. Um um the there's a question about the composite balls and whether they're impervious or semi-permeable uh this is not permeable because we have tested actually um, uh this is not directly my previous research i have already published actually the ball and and, and uh, like a heating several times even the water is not in the filtration system no water is not going through the ball because it's so hard and also it has uh, adsorbent and also titanium dioxide, it has uh, soil. So all together, we gave a very hard surface. So it's not permeable. Even we cannot use as a water filtration ball for uh, actually this uh, composite. Okay, and that may relate to this other question was, which was about whether the balls could be resorbed and reused to reduce sludge. Like, is there a way to recapture the material? Yeah. Because uh, titanium dioxide is, uh, there is no way its activity destroy. Maybe it is, it will be low, but the titanium dioxide, again, we can uh, take it in our lab because it has only soil and charcoal doesn't have any harmful effect. Again, we can grind, break it, and we can um, separate. Like a titanium dioxide is light, lighter. When we we'll break and we put in the water, soil will go down, but titanium dioxide will be floating. Okay, titan dioxide is very light compared to the soil. So soil will go down. So in that way, we can separate it. Okay. Um, did you test the aquatic toxicity using these? Uh, well, that is a, uh, our actual target because uh, toxicity is needed to actually very specialized instrument. So right at this moment, actually, uh, we don't have that, like LCMSMS, and then we'll send to the toxicity lab. Uh, I think our uh, next six months we'll go do do that. Like, uh, is there any toxicity potential? Because if if it is again secondary pollution, so no meaning of use this kind of composite. So as I mentioned in the slide, that uh, already people mentioned like titanium dioxide with microcystin LR will not produce any toxic compound. But their research and literature, not from me. So I will do again. Okay. And then I think this is similar, but um, there was a question about whether there's any negative impacts um, as it degrades. Um, and it sounds like you maybe haven't done those tests yet, but you're gonna be doing them in the future, so. Okay. Um, any thoughts on um, 
doping the composite with nutrient pollutant phosphorus for enhancing efficiency or upcycling uh, phosphorus in non-fertilizer applications. Yeah, well, actually, we have another project uh, actually going on in the simultaneously, like only for the uh, jack, like zinc activated charcoal, we made our, and we applied in the field to control the age of, uh, like control actually the phosphorus and nitrogen from agricultural field. And we found actually the tremendous good effect, like it absorbs the excess of nitrate and phosphate from our agreement. And we have a leaching plot, we have a leachate collector actually underneath the ward, underneath the soil, actually ground field. So we have collected and we have analyzed, we found actually very interesting as a, like it could reduce at least 30% to 40% in the field, uh, just only for the charcoal. Because titanium dioxide doesn't have any adsorption capacity. This is, it, this is not the adsorbent, only the charcoal. And our uh, goal is to use the agricultural, agricultural so that farmer can use. And we would like to help the people from um, Ohio agriculture so that they can use the, their agricultural byproduct. For example, uh, this is uh, make contest, which is no use. We don't use this kind of. So just only the chemical treatment, it gives a very good absorbent. So, and also like a corn, like they are wasted. So we can use, we can reuse. That's our goal. Okay. Um... In flowing systems, is there a concern for these to get covered by sediment or turbidity that might impact their efficacy? Um, I think you had mentioned using them in floating um, things so that that wouldn't happen, presumably. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then what effects would you expect um, on beneficial algal species? Uh, because TN dioxide is not toxic, it's environment friendly. And soil doesn't have any role, and charcoal only absorbs the pollutant. It is giving a positive role, not the negative role. Okay, and the advantage of composite actually absorb and absorb, keep on the ball, and then photocatalyst attack and react and degrade. Okay, so the two things simultaneously happening in the same composite. That's the advantage. And our target was to actually, if I directly put the titanium dioxide powder in the water, I cannot re uh, recover. Like it will mix with the water. That's the thing, the advantage, like uh, it will float, it will absorb, it will degrade, and we can take it out, like after two months, three months, six months. Again, we can reuse, we can deploy again another set. That's the thing. And also low cost, like titanium dioxide any, uh, is not expensive. And titanium dioxide, everybody knows actually. Maybe you don't. Like if you go to the five star hotel, if you go into the bathroom, actually the tap surface is titanium dioxide. So, like uh, in the bathroom light, it produces hydroxyl on the tap, tap surface and it kills the microbes. So, that's the thing. Okay, great. Um, and would it be possible to fabricate the material to have a greater surface area? Ah, uh, well, actually, surface area. Our target actually, you know, like a titanium dioxide is the main thing. So there are a lot of titanium dioxide, nano size titanium dioxide available in the market. But if you go more and more nano size, expense is too high. Since like a normal category gives a good result, why we go for the like expensive one? That's my question, you know? So because something we have to get sustainable and low cost. Because lake shed is a very, very big area we have to cover like a, be very big area, so we don't want to put too much uh, money in that uh, thing that gets. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, well, that is all the questions we have for now. So thanks so much. Um, and uh, you can take a look at uh, the questions um, after we get off here, and then we're going to move on to our special feedback session. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right, uh, well, I'm going to introduce our next presenters, uh, Dr. Liz. Yeah, it looks like you're oh. in um, presenter mode here. Oh yeah, thank you. Okay, there we go. Um, so our presenters for this session will be Liz Parati as the NOAA OIP Education and Outreach Coordinator serving as a liaison between scientists, educators, and stakeholder communities. 
She comes to the OAP from the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, where she manages or managed Oregon's shellfish resources and supported ocean acidification and hypoxia policy as staff for Oregon's Ocean Acidification and Hypoxia Coordinating Council. Liz earned her BA in Biology and Environmental Science at Boston University and continued her career at the UC Berkeley Integrated Biology Department and UC Museum of Paleontology. Her doctoral research focused on the role of geology and geologic history on intertidal communities. Liz's interests in invertebrate biology, evolution, and ecology then sent her to the University of Hawaii at Manoa to study the developmental mechanisms of settlement and effects of hydrodynamics on fouling communities. Liz lives in Oregon with her family and enjoys camping, crabbing and clamming, water sports, sci-fi fantasy media, and has a budding interest in cosplay. All right, and then Natalie Lord is our other presenter. She is a 2023 Knauss Fellow joining OAP as a Capacity Building and Stakeholder Engagement Fellow. Natalie is earning her doctorate from the University of New Hampshire in Natural Resources and Environmental Studies. In 2022, she received her master's from the University of New Hampshire, and her research focused on the intersection of sustainable marine food systems and social equity for the aquaculture industry of New England. Natalie has devoted her career to assisting coastal communities with the sustainable management of their marine resources. Natalie grew up on the coast of Maine and enjoys spending time with her family and friends in the great outdoors. All right, I'm going to stop sharing so that you can share your slides. Great, thank you very much. Let me just pop this up here for you. Okay, and I apologize for the header. We haven't figured out how to get rid of that, but um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Um, thank you again for having us. Um, HABS is near and dear to my heart with my past research in management and shellfish. So uh, today we're going to spend most of the time hearing from you, but I am going to spend a few minutes talk, giving you a little bit of context about freshwater acidification, its connection to HABS, as, as well as share some resources with you. Um, so we are the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program, and our role is to select, fund, and manage high-priority, high-quality research that will basically prepare us uh, for changing conditions and resources, and we do that through expanding our understanding and through partnerships. And even though we're the Ocean Acidification Program, uh, we're mandated to um, assess and prepare people for coastal acidification and freshwater acidification in the Great Lakes. So uh, you may know that fresh water also ex experiences uh, acidification and researchers project that the pH will decline at a rate similar to the oceans and coasts in response to increasing atmospheric carbon dioxide by people. So we're not talking about acidification through mechanisms like um, acid rain, but we're talking about it through this mechanism. And the average pH and alkalinity vary according to the geology of each lake basin, um, for example, Lake Superior has the most acidified waters and Lake Michigan has the least. Uh, in addition, we of course see considerable short-term spatial and temporal availability in pH that is largely driven by uh, varying rates in photosynthesis, respiration, seasonal mixing, and a lot of these mechanisms are analogous to what we see in our oceans and coasts. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of long-term robust monitoring of this type of acidification in the Great Lakes system until recently. And like I mentioned, uh, we're talking about this type of acidification. So uh, the Great Lakes, like our oceans and coasts, act like a great sponge to absorb this excess carbon dioxide from our atmosphere. And with that absorption, we see a series of chemical uh, reactions and that not only increases the acidity um, and makes the waters more acidified, uh, but can also limit important um, biological minerals uh, that are building blocks that a lot of living organisms use, everything from phytoplankton to shellfish, and can e even impact impact sensory systems of fish. Um, and so of course we're interested in those impacts and um, how that impacts people who rely on these healthy ecosystems. So NOAA does have um, a decadal um, acidification research and monitoring plan for our oceans, coasts, and Great Lakes. Um, and the specific goals for the Great Lakes are to establish a robust monitoring network that has these carbonate chemistry parameters. We need to know, be, know what's happening in the environment and how fast things are changing. 
Uh, we then need to look at uh, the biological response. And right now, a lot of that sensitivity research is focused on HABs um, at NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab, as well as other regional academic institutions. Uh, many of you are probably here in the audience. And then finally, developing models that help us predict and forecast. So linking that physical, chemical, and biological information we have. And then uh, finally looking at the human dimensions aspects of this, of engaging our stakeholders to help identify um, topics that are important and to build adaptation strategies to these impacts. So what's going on in this region? So the US EPA does conduct long-term water quality monitoring uh, for all five Great Lakes, uh, but the sampling methodology and frequency are often not sufficient to detect the types of trends in pH we anticipate, uh, nor the freshwater inorganic carbonate system that I mentioned. Uh, there are a handful of monitoring programs capable of detecting these trends, and it's really an urgent need to establish these baseline data sets and then to um, link this research to these biological responses for things like HABs. So OAP plays a role in bridging gaps and basically bringing scientific information to stakeholders and rights holders who need it in the ways that they're, they'll actually use it. And so right now we're conducting a nationwide stakeholder and rights holder needs assessment. And here are just some of the groups um, that we're reaching out to, um, including researchers, uh, water quality professionals like um, and uh, educators, which may be in this audience today um, in the Great Lakes region. Um, I do want to provide a couple of resources for you, and Natalie will put some of these links into the chat. Um, I did mention the our um, 2020 to 2029 research and monitoring plan for the Great Lakes chapter. You can either find that through this QR code or the link that she'll put in the chat. The Thunder Bay uh, National Marine Sanctuary also created a really great freshwater acidification research in the Great Lakes regions. Uh, one pager that's a great handout for you and your network if you'd like to share and learn more about the status of that right now. And if you're in a position where you'd like to help increase awareness about your work with HABs and acidification, we do have an open funding opportunity right now. It's our education and outreach mini grant um, that it closes February 23rd and it's specifically to target this type of outreach um, to underserved communities, tribes, or indigenous communities. And again, we'll put that link in the chat if you'd like to see the announcement and apply. So I want to spend, again, most of this time um, hearing from you. Um, really, your valuable feedback you give today about your priorities, your concerns, the information, where you get your information, will help inform how we can best uh, provide technical assistance to you. Uh, meeting our congressional mandates. And, you know, a lot of uh, you are new to us, so this is a great way to meet you and kind of start this conversation and relationship. Um, and so with that, you know, feel free to uh, reach, reach out to me if you have any um, further concerns or want to chat more about this, you can reach me at liz.parati at noaa.gov. Uh, and again, here's our website with everything about acidification. Natalie will also put the specific link to our freshwater acidification Great Lakes section on our website. And uh, we have a Google form link with the same questions we're gonna run through today in an interactive anonymous way um, that if you have colleagues who you think oh, would really want to have their voices heard, feel free to share that. So with that, uh, we're gonna switch to um, using Mentimeter. Um, so most of you are joining via your phone or laptop. Um, you can either use this QR code or open up a tab at menti.com and it will ask for um, it will ask for this uh, eight digit code that you see at the top of your screen. Um, you'll also see this eight digit code moving forward um, should you be a little bit behind us. So I'll just give you a minute to do that. Uh, Minty meter, like I said, is anonymous. Um, it's a great way for you to give your feedback. Um, we encourage you to be as specific as you can with your answers. Um, uh, if you have a lot to contribute, like different ideas, feel free to separate those by commas, or you could just add multiple responses. Um, if you see something in there that really resonates with you, type it in again. That's kind of like upvoting something so that we can kind of um, help identify some commonalities uh, amongst this uh, group of people. 
Um, and then if you really feel like, you know, I don't know, I don't have enough information to answer this question, letting us know that is really valuable too, because um, that helps us understand kind of where we are in terms of, um, you know, education and outreach within this community as well. Um, so with that, I'll stop sharing and uh, let Natalie take over with the Mentimeter. Okay, so can everyone see the screen? Just wanna make sure. Yep, I can see it. Okay, great. Um, so thank you, Liz. It looks like folks have already gotten started here. Um, so as Liz was saying, everything's anonymous and um, we're interested in, in hearing um, as much or as little as you would like to share uh, wh while we go through these prompts. Um, if you would like to skip a question, you can use the skip, the, just the arrow, forward arrow. Um, you don't have to answer every question. Um, and then you can also look through these and see, you know, who's, who's here today at this symposium. So um, we have a lot of HABs researchers, educators, program coordinators, aquatic science, learning experiences. Yes, yeah, so we have a lot of educators and scientists. Aquatic invasive species specialists, state agency staff, lab managers, commission staff. Great. Awesome. Um, so well, as we go through this live, you can still answer questions, even um, if I skip ahead as well. Okay, so I'm going to go to the next one, which is um, what stakeholder groups do you engage with? So um, we're interested in, you know, what community members you might be engaging with, if you're engaging with state agency staff, NGOs, um, who attends, you know, if you're a water quality specialist, who is attending your programming, if you're an educator, are you educate, are you K through 12, are you general public, um, more um, nonprofit style educating, uh, this will help us identify who is engaged in water quality work in the Great Lakes and help us build out our network as we continue to expand our programming here. Um, so we've got... A and I, and I see a couple people saying, you know, I don't really know who my users are um, or I don't, mm -hmm. I don't feel like I have a user. Um, and if that's if that's your sentiment, please, you know, share that as well. That's good information. Um, we found even with our ocean acidification folks that sometimes they don't have a good handle on that. And so that might be opportunity for building collaborations. And that's something our program can assist with. Great. Yes, yeah, so we've got fishermen, water managers, researchers, federal and state agencies, lake managers, homeowners, stormwater management, Yep. Academic institutions, farmers, and tribes as well. This is great. So again, those of you working with tribes might benefit from our education mini grant coming up. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to move to the next question. Um, so for this, we're interested in your biggest concerns regarding water quality in the Great Lakes. So this could be, um, you know, first of all, we know that acidification might not be your top priorities, but we're interested in what is. Um, and perhaps, you know, maybe it's HABs as we're seeing here, um, but perhaps it is other water quality parameters that we should be aware of that might be overlaps for acidification monitoring and observing as we move forward in this region. So we've got sediment pollution, turbidity, yep, HABs, toxins. I'm seeing a lot of climate mm -hmm. change, which of course shares the same underlying mechanism as this acidification we're talking about. PFAS, species loss, nitrogen and phosphorus contamination, yep. Habitat, Temperature, drinking water quality, water level changes. Yeah, so a lot of this has to do with climate change impacts, microplastics. Yeah, we might have a lot of 
uh, municipal water and drinking water folks in here that aren't directly working with HABs. Um, so, you know, apply this question to that as well. Um, you know, what are your primary concerns? Is it monitoring? Is it uh, detection? Is it, um, you know, just the quality that you're seeing? Feel free to, 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 to share that with us as well. Some of it has to do with education, like a personal connection with our natural waters. Yep. Common change impacts food web dynamics, invasive species. Yeah, this is great. Thank you, everyone. Okay, the next question um, is really, it's about um, the information that you use for your work. So we're interested if you're using publicly available data sets that are within the Great Lakes region. So if you're using observing data, if you're using NOAA weather data, if you're accessing um, buoy data or the EPA's water quality monitoring data, we're interested in, in where um, those sources are being used, um, as well as if you're using any academic literature, um, collaborating with you know other folks in the region who might be doing similar work as you. Let's see, we've got a lot of EPA. Great Lakes Habs Collaborative. Yep, the uh, Great Lakes NOAA Lab, state agency, data portals, runoff forecasts, reservoir levels, sonar mapping, academic literature, conferences and webinars. Great. in like NOAA, EPA, if yeah. you have specific sites or portals, um, please let us know that too. Um, it helps us kind of leverage efforts so that we can deliver information to places that you're already going. Subject matter experts. So like water quality portals. Um, yeah, what are those portals? Yeah. Yeah, because we know there's quite a number of them in the Great Lakes. Um, so we would like to, uh, you know, help identify where all of the data is right now because we know it might be a little bit scattered. GIS, yep, Wisconsin Lake, state agency, environmental justice screening, yep, that's the EPA. NOAA tide charts, fisheries. Okay, great. Alrighty. And the next question has to do with acidification. So um, we're wondering, you know, if this is a priority area of your work, if it, if you interact or study or research acidification in your everyday job, or if it's more of a co-stressor for something that you're working on, or perhaps it might not even be within the realm of um, the subject area that you're working on. Um, so. With this information, we'll be able to find intersections in the work that you are conducting right now to help see if we might be able to have more acidification parameters, like carbonate chemistry parameters, added to your water quality work that you're already conducting. Yeah, I think nationally, one of our biggest successes has been actually joining HABs, uh, the HABs research community with the ocean, ocean acidification, acidification research community. Um, Cause you know, we all know, we all go to our, like our local, um, you know, topic specific symposia and conferences, um, but me really making those connections can help bridge those effects. So um, I'm seeing a lower response rate here. Maybe that is because you're like, you know, I really, this is maybe the first time I'm really thinking about acidification and its relation to HABs or water quality. If that's the case, just let us know that. Um, uh, it gives us a, an idea of like kind of the status of where, where, where this group, uh, where these communities are uh, with respect to that. Uh, we appreciate that feedback as well. And also if it is a priority, you can also provide more context on the work that you do. Yeah, some are very high, some are. Yeah, so it looks like we have some uh, variable. Yeah. All right. Um, thanks for people are saying low, and this is why. Um, I'm, yeah. you know, your what your other priorities are. Thank you for that feedback. Great. Yeah. Ready for the next question, Liz? 
Yep. Is this me? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so what information would you want about a certification or water quality that could assist in your work? So we've talked about where you go to get information already, where a certification ranks in your priorities. Uh, but is there any other kind of water quality or certification information you would want? Maybe it's just basic information, like how is this playing out in the in the Great Lakes? How does this relate to HABs um, or the work that you do? Um, it, you know, it could be as basic, basic as that, or where do I go to get uh, data on this? You know, where can I see the real time kind of monitoring information for this? Um, um, so just general information is what I'm seeing here. Um, effective working solutions, so very solution based, uh, you know, like how do we address this? Um, how might we, um, you know, uh, kind of mitigate the effects of acidica acidification um, within this, um, how might we, uh, you know, improve our water quality and our water quality monitoring. Um, so just kind of more, so I'm seeing here more information, um, any available information. So it sounds like there might be some paucity of information out there in plain language, as well as some technical information. Um, so if you have um, ideas about like, you know, questions you'd like answered, feel free to pop those in here as well. Um, uh, like, like we're seeing here, what impact does acidification have on organic contaminants? Uh, that's a great, great question um, as, when it comes to kind of assessing water quality and how that might change um, as we see the Great Lakes change with this acidification um, over time. Yeah, so if you have specific questions, you're like, I really don't know about this, feel free to pop that in there. Thank you. And then we can uh, move to the next question. So list any barriers you have to accessing information you need to make the decisions on water quality management or for your work. Um, so you may not be a water quality manager, you may be a researcher, um, an educator. Um, you know, what would be a barrier to kind of using this type of uh, information, water quality information, maybe it's resources, maybe it's time, maybe it's that um, all the information isn't centralized, um, or you're looking for a specific product that would really help you share um, about your work. Um, you know, just kind of thinking about um, those types of um, uh, barriers or needs that you would have um, that would assist with this. Um, so it says you don't manage directly. So we, we can we can apply this to like, um, apply that to your position. Um, so, you know, uh, who to call with federal regulators for getting involved with water quality, um, peer reviewed articles um, are behind some paywalls. So getting access to that primary literature, that open access um, certainly has become a hot topic, especially within our research communities. Um, every group has its own information data portals and it's hard to keep track of all of them. So um, if not centralization, maybe um, at least kind of a go-to resource of here's where you can find all of it. Um, incon inconsistent and incomplete data. Um, that's uh, interesting to hear about that. L love to hear kind of more about um, uh, why that happens or, you know, uh, a little bit more detail about that if you have um, the inclination to kind of type that in this chat. Um, how can it affect fish species and maybe some other kinds of organisms that are, are important to you. Okay, long-term funding, funding time, all those kinds of resources for sure. Um, incomplete data. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of incomplete data. Um, I guess I would ask uh, what data are is missing that you would like to see. Uh, feel free to pop that in here as well. Okay, I think we can move to the next one since we only have five minutes left and I just wanna make sure to get through um, these questions. Um, how would partnerships help better prepare you for the impacts to your local ecosystem? So we have things like um, funding resources, um, uh, collaboration with others who do similar uh, work that's productive, um, a lot of people are unsure. Maybe they don't uh, have a, an, an idea of who do they need to partner with. Um, you know, I mentioned like there could be a lot of these silos, um, you know, within these different kinds of disciplines, right? Um, 
data specific to your system. Um, great, thank you for sharing that. Uh, if you have specific ideas of the types of partnerships, uh, feel free to type that in as well as you think about it. All right, let's move to the next question as people continue to fill that one out. So if we developed a toolkit of such um, that would have the resources that you would like to see included for your particular work, uh, what would you want? So we heard before that, you know, a lot of people were looking for some general information, uh, maybe thinking about what kinds of forms that would be is like an infographic, videos, um, uh, one pagers, if I'm seeing information and fact sheets here, some FAQs for the average person, um, what they could do to help um, or what it is. Um, uh, we did share, check, check out the chat for that one pager produced by one of the sanctuaries, um, might get you started with that. Um, specifically for extension professionals, so maybe some of our Sea Grant extension professionals, uh, getting people up to speed. I'm seeing, um, how does this relate to climate change? Uh, making those links for people and how does that relate to fisheries uh, that people might be interested in uh, with the lakes. Um, not sure, a lot of unsure and that's that's really great um, information for us as well. Um, uh, it gives us an idea of what people would do. Um, some different kinds of guidance. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that means, if you could say a little bit more about what that kind of guidance means, um, guidance on how to talk about it, communicate about it, guidance on how to move forward um, in terms of incorporating it with your research. Um, all of that is kind of useful information for us. Information on prevention and what actions people can take. So again, that kind of uh, action solution part of it, I think that's really important for any type of education. Um, GIS shape files. Um, so basically making this into uh, a spatially explicit kind of availability of our data. Um, and I know that there are some of those within, you know, kind of local repositories. Um, some of the academic uh, labs will have like maps of like where people are doing projects, but keeping those updated and getting people um, awareness of that is, can be difficult. Um, Social media templates, so using communication best practices. That's something that our program's developing right now um, that will be available on our website uh, within the next month under our resources page. Um, okay, let's do the last question. Um, so basically any other thoughts and suggestions or things that we didn't ask you that you kind of thought um, we should know about? Um, uh, here's your opportunity to kind of share that. Uh, any questions you have for us that we can uh, maybe address as well. Do we have a newsletter on the latest research findings, areas of need for research? We don't have a newsletter, um, but you know, again, go take a look at that Great Lakes uh, monitoring plan. That's basically what our priorities are and the objectives um, for this particular, uh, there's a whole chapter um, on the Great Lakes. Um, so you might you might get a lot of uh, information on that. And as we have funding availability, it'll be based on those priorities um, and objectives. Are there partnerships that work um, with the USGS uh, Water Science Centers? Um, yes, we do work and collaborate a little bit with the USGS, uh, but could talk more about that. Feel free to email me if you'd like uh, more information on that or um, you know help build help build that partnership. Um, okay, outreach lessons on freshwater and HABs, certainly. Um, we see that a lot of the request for um, ocean acidification as well. So I think we've come to time. I just want to thank everybody for your valuable feedback. Um, you know, if you found this overwhelming <laughs> um, or, you know, you think about it a little bit more and say, you know, I'd really like to kind of share this information. Again, this, this really helps us kind of... Um, provide the best assistance for you. Um, there is that form that we have in the chat there. I'll put it in the link here again. You can always email me uh, for a one-on-one -on -one conversation as well, um, or um, use this form that has a lot of the same questions in that. So I appreciate your time. Thanks everyone. Great to hear all the research today too, research updates. All right. Thanks a lot, Liz and Natalie. Uh, I think you addressed this, but there was a, a specific comment from someone about USGS Science Center. So you can take a look at that 
in the Q&A as well. Um, let me get my screen up here again. All right. So that is our last uh, session for this morning. So thank you for attending. And our next session will be focusing on HABs outreach and communication and we'll begin at 1230 Central Time. I do have all the speakers from this morning session on the screen. So um, I'll leave that up uh, in case anybody wants to uh, get that information down. And otherwise we will see you again at 1230.